We received orders to set up the mortars on the inland side of a Japanese pillbox and prepare to fire on the enemy to our company's front. We asked Company K's gunnery sergeant, Gunnery Sergeant W. R. Saunders, if he knew of any enemy troops in the bunker. It appeared undamaged. He said some of the men had thrown grenades through the ventilators, and he was sure there were no live enemy inside. I heard something behind me in the pillbox. Japanese were talking in low, excited voices. Metal rattled against an iron grating. I grabbed my carbine and yelled, Bergen, there are nips in that pillbox. All the men readied their weapons as Bergen came over to have a look, kidding me with, Shuck, Sledgehammer, you're cracking up. Wake up, Sledge. He looked into the ventilator port directly behind me. It was rather small, approximately six inches by eight inches, and covered with iron bars about a half inch apart. What he saw brought forth a stream of curses in his best Texas style against all Nippon. He stuck his carbine muzzle through the bars, fired two quick shots, and yelled, I got him right in the face. John Redifer and Vincent Santos jumped on top. Things got quiet. I was nearest the door, and Bergen yelled to me, Look in and see what's in there, Sledgehammer. Being trained to take orders without question, I raised my head above the sandbank and peered into the door of the bunker. It nearly cost me my life. Not more than six feet from me crouched a Japanese machine gunner. His eyes were black dots and a tan, impassive face, topped with a familiar mushroom helmet. The muzzle of his light machine gun stared at me like a gigantic third eye. Fortunately for me, I reacted first. Not having time to get my carbine into firing position, I jerked my head down so fast my helmet almost flew off. A split second later, he fired a burst of six or eight rounds. The bullets tore a furrow through the bank just above my head and showered sand on me. A million thoughts raced through my terrified mind. Of how my folks had nearly lost their youngest. Of what a stupid thing I had done to look directly into a pillbox full of Japanese without even having my carbine at the ready. And of just how much I hated the enemy anyway. Many a Marine veteran had already lost his life on Peleliu for making less of a mistake than I had just made. Bergen yelled and asked if I were all right. A hoarse squawk was all the answer I could muster, but his voice brought me to my senses. I crawled around to the front, then up on top of the bunker, before the enemy machine gunner could have another try at me. Behind us, Santos yelled that he had located a ventilator pipe without a cover. He began dropping grenades into it. Each one exploded in the pillbox beneath us with a muffled bam. Luckily for the men with Bergen, the grenades were thrown out the back. Santos and I shouted a warning and hit the deck on the sand on top of the pillbox. But Redifer merely raised his arm over his face. He took several fragments in the forearm. The Amtrak rattling toward us by this time was certainly a welcome sight. As it pulled into position, several more Japanese raced from the pillbox in a tight group. Each carried his bayoneted rifle in his right hand and held up his pants with his left hand. This action so amazed me that I stared in disbelief and didn't fire my carbine. I wasn't afraid, as I had been under shell fire, just filled with wild excitement. My buddies were more effective than I and cut down the enemy with a hail of bullets. They tumbled onto the hot coral in a forlorn tangle of bare legs, falling rifles, and rolling helmets. I saw a Japanese soldier appear at the blasted opening. He was grim determination personified, 
as he drew back his arm to throw a grenade at us. My carbine was already up. When he appeared, I lined up my sights on his chest and began squeezing off shots. As the first bullet hit him, his face contorted in agony. His knees buckled. The grenade slipped from his grasp. All the men near me, including the Amtrak machine gunner, had seen him and began firing. The soldier collapsed in the fusillade, and the grenade went off at his feet. Even in the midst of these fast-moving events, I looked down at my carbine with sober reflection. I had just killed a man at close range. That I had seen clearly the pain on his face when my bullets hit him came as a jolt. It suddenly made the war a very personal affair. The expression on that man's face filled me with shame and then disgust for the war and all the misery it was causing. Flamethrower came up, carried by Corporal Womack from Mississippi. He was a brave, good-natured guy and popular with the troops. But he was one of the fiercest-looking Marines I ever saw. He was big and husky, with a fiery red beard well powdered with white coral dust. He reminded me of some wild Viking. I was glad we were on the same side. Womack then aimed the nozzle at the opening made by the 75-millimeter gun. He pressed the trigger. With a whoosh, the flame leaped at the opening. Even the stoic Japanese couldn't suppress the agony of death by fire and suffocation. When our gunny came by and saw the results of our encounter with the pillbox he had thought was empty, he looked sheepish. He gazed in amazement at the enemy dead scattered around. We really razzed him about it, or rather, we gave him the nearest thing approaching the raz that we marine privates dared hand out to the austere personage of Gunnery Sergeant Saunders, 